Thank you very much, Ramel. You, you had me there for a second when you're going to tell two things that nobody knows. Uh, I don't know what that would have been, but anyway. Uh, okay, well, anyway, it's great to be here, and thanks so much uh, to all of you for, for coming out today. We hope to have a very meaningful, impactful conversation today, and we'll be delivering that product uh, directly uh, to the Deputy Prime Minister uh, next week. So as Canadians, as you've heard, and as I think everybody knows, uh, we are at a critical juncture. People are understandably worried about the future. Now I know you're well acquainted with that situation. I don't need to spend any time describing the litany of things that aren't quite going right uh, today. You know, it's phrases like second last in the OECD. We don't have to mention those things, right? We don't have to. We know we're, we have some important things to do to, to create a fork in our road. So my job today is to act as a scene setter and to, I think, hope anyway, to simplify things if I can so that our day is as constructive as it can be. So let me just begin with this. Um, prior to the pandemic, inflation was exactly on target at 2%. Canadian rate of unemployment was at a 40-year low, which, by the way, goes back to when I graduated from Western. I did, you know, Ramel's really nice. He doesn't mention the dates. But anyway, unemployment was at a 40-year low, inflation exactly on target at 2%. It just doesn't get any better than that in terms of starting point if you're about to be slammed by a major shock. And this is exactly why Canada has been so resilient during this pandemic. Yes, there were great fiscal policies and uh, you know, supporting role for monetary policy and so on. But it's the resilience that was already there. Just as a healthy individual usually can shake off COVID, a healthy economy can shake off COVID. So restoring that starting point, that basic situation is clearly job one. Now, I happen to think it will be easier to achieve than many others seem to think. And I just want to walk through a little bit of a thought experiment with you. Let's pretend just for a moment that Russia's invasion of Ukraine never happened. Now, when the pandemic hit, very few of us believed that fiscal policies could be as effective as they turned out to be, not just here, but almost everywhere. Economies in general snapped back much faster than any economist believed. Phrases like the worst recession since the Great Depression, you know, were everywhere. Well, we didn't have a depression. And to be honest, if you define it as we conventionally do, we didn't even have a recession. The economy was up and growing very quickly again. Now, looking back, it looks as though interest rates probably could have moved back to neutral or normal, or whatever you want to term you like to use, much sooner, possibly as early as the start of 2021. Well, that's, of course, really easy to say now, looking in the rearview mirror. At the time, the most important risk that we faced was deflation and depression. Certainly, the ingredients of those things were there. So it was not illegitimate to say this could be the worst thing since the Great Depression. It could have been the second Great Depression. Inflation had been running below target in many countries for a long time, so that sense of underachieving was very present. So as a group, central banks basically decided to hold rates low, very low, zero effectively, or negative in some cases, until inflation returned to normal. Now that strategy, you can check in your economics 101, I still call it 101 because that's what we call it at Queen's, I think at Western it's 110 or something. It's funny. It's a, but it's the same, but with a difference. But anyway, uh, if you look back in your first economics textbook, you will know immediately that this strategy absolutely guaranteed that inflation would go above 2%. It guaranteed it. And that's just because there are lags between interest rates and inflation. Just as there's a lag between the instant you decide I should stop at this stoplight and when you get your foot off the gas and onto the brake. And if you wait until you're just an inch or two from the line, 
you are going to blow through that intersection. It's not different from that. It's not more complicated than that. Now, the overshoot in inflation would have been modest, maybe a percentage point. We all could have managed this. But at just the wrong time, a lunatic invaded Ukraine. Now, commodity prices skyrocketed, and they got exported all around the world, and that little inflation overshoot became a gigantic one. So there are two distinct inflation channels operating on our economy. Call it the internal one, the one that we would have overshot no matter what, and the external one, which, of course, no one could have prepared for. And once it's happened, actually, there's nothing you can do about it. Now, the external inflation drivers, the things that drove inflation up, rising commodity prices, shipping constraints, costs of shipping, but supply chain issues, to put the broad term on it, they have all dissipated. Those things are not driving inflation anymore. So externally driven inflation is actually falling quite rapidly, all by itself. In other words, the part of inflation that is externally driven really is transitory. It's okay to use the word transitory. Now it's become this stigma. I can't use the word transitory because look how wrong you were, you know, 18 months ago. It's ridiculous. So it's transitory in the sense that it will go away on its own over the next year or so. Mechanics. You raise the price of oil, double the price of oil. Today, inflation goes up for how long? 12 months. And then the tail catches up with the lead and that 12-month comparison becomes flat again. That's if you know, oil prices stay where they, where they double to. Of course, if it takes a year for oil prices to double, then it will take 24 months for the tail to catch up. Well, that's two years transitory. And we aren't even close to that length of time yet. So it's my guess, and I, I emphasize the word guess, because we have no models for this. Because this is a unique situation. Let's hope it's unique. My guess is that inflation will fall to below 4%, more or less, by itself. So the task that we face is to move inflation from something less than 4% to the 1% to 3% range. Does that sound like an heroic accomplishment? It doesn't sound that difficult, actually. And I think that the actions that are being taken to get us there will turn out to be even more powerful than a lot of people think. Does anybody here think the sensitivity of the economy to interest rate movements is less today than it was five or ten years ago? Most people think it might be higher. There's a lot of debt out there. Well, read the paper. Sounds pretty sensitive, right? Yeah, I think it's more sensitive today than it was before, mainly because of the debt that's lying around out there. Companies are feeling it, variable rate debt. Households, of course, are feeling it. We're getting to those uh, trigger points and even fixed payment mortgages. Secondly, the loss of purchasing power due to higher prices for food and energy is obviously operating. This is more powerful than interest rates, and it happens as soon as it happens, not with an 8 or 12 or... 18-month lag, but immediately, the day the price of gas doubles, that's the week you have less money left for the groceries. Okay, that's immediate, and it's everywhere, not just interest-sensitive things like houses or cars. Everywhere. Now, Walmart has noticed that. They've noticed that every shopping cart that goes through has less stuff in it. Well, why is that? Well, you had to fill the gas tank before you went to Walmart, and there the weekly budget is squeezed. So what's Walmart's strategy with this? Is it to cause inflation to go up more, like raise prices in order to get more stuff into your shopping cart? No, Walmart's strategy is we're going to pound our suppliers. We're going to get those prices back down because we want those shopping carts full. Well, that's disinflation. That's how disinflation happens. It doesn't happen through some magic wand of interest rates. Okay, It happens through competition for your, for your dollar. 
So Walmart has noticed Walmart is an agent of disinflation. And so will everybody else that competes with Walmart. And the third thing that's operating that's going to make things happen faster than everybody seems to think, quantitative tightening. Now, I know that sounds pretty technical, but we all got familiar with quantitative easing. Okay, We did that in order to break the, the log jams in financial markets during the crisis. It was a very powerful tool in easing mode. It made a very big difference between the risk of having a depression or not. Well, quantitative tightening is just the same thing in reverse. So why wouldn't it be powerful when operating in reverse? Folks, nobody is talking about that because we haven't done that before. Okay, this is just something that we know works in the same direction as interest rates, but we're not sure by how much. So for those three reasons, I'm expecting inflation to fall much faster than markets are expecting. And each time that happens, like we saw two weeks ago when the U.S. inflation number came out, and it was about a third of what all the forecasters said it would be, those who have models that don't work in this situation, bear that in mind, please. Inflation fell faster than they thought. Well, the relief was palpable, right? And you can feel that relief now, that sense that, oh, maybe, maybe this journey is going to end sooner than we first thought. Of course it is, because markets exaggerate everything. That's easy to remember. Markets exaggerate everything, okay, including this. So the dominant investment theme as we go ahead will be what I call disinflation relief. But through that process, stagflation is the thing we're going to observe. High but falling inflation at the same time as the economy is kind of struggling to, to get any growth going. Stagflation, in fact, is the optimal path forward for us at this stage. It doesn't sound nice, but it is. It's the best we can do. Now, just using the word stagflation conjures up images. Images of, those of us who are old enough, the 1970s. And it's fair to say that we could repeat history, okay? It's certainly fair to ask whether history is about to repeat itself, because we have a lot of the ingredients. And most people are pretty quick to say, no, 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 there's a lot of differences too. Of course there are. That was 50 years ago. But in the early 1970s, what was the most important feature? When I graduated from high school, I'll say it, 1974, okay, in Oshawa, you know, where the only employer was Generous Motors. Oh, sorry, General Motors, excuse me. But, you know, as kids, we all called it Generous Motors for a reason. The kids who, whose parents didn't work at Generous Motors, you could tell the difference in the kids who did. During that early 1970s, the most important feature of the macro scene was unemployment was rising. That's what I talked about in my valedictorian address at high school. Because people like me, the baby boomers, were just entering the workforce and entering it in droves. So this was, you know, 1945 to 1965. That's your baby boom thing. So, you know, back in the mid 1970s, we really had the big rise in labor force. Now, central banks during that period, for very many other reasons too, but this, when you look at the history, this was a really key factor. Central banks felt that they could keep interest rates low to keep boosting the economy because unemployment was rising. And what they wanted to do was create more jobs for the people who were entering the workforce. And the reason they thought they could do that was because all their models said inflation and unemployment can never rise at the same time. And what happened? Well, now we call it the great inflation of the 1970s. We put capital letters on great and inflation because it's so great. Um, it spread globally, of course, because we had a fixed exchange rate system to go with it. So everybody felt the same thing. In other words, out of benign circumstances came what we would now call a life-altering economic event. And the reason for it, the underlying reason, is that a major force was operating beneath the surface of the global economy, and that is what I would now call the youthification of the workforce, the entry of all those young folks. Now, this was a spectacular failure of the economics profession. This probably hasn't been one that big since, although maybe. But this spectacular failure on the part of the economics profession 
prompted John Kenneth Galbraith to write a great book, The Age of Uncertainty. Economics was completely redeveloped over the next 10 years, say. And inflation targets for central banks were one of the consequences of that big rethink. Now, the similarities of the 1970s to our current situation is what prompted me to write my little book, which I call The Next Age of Uncertainty. Well, that's, you know, always piggyback on a successful book, right? But today, those very same baby boomers, and not just a wave, exactly the same baby boomers, the same people, are exiting the workforce in droves. Here in Canada, 10 to 15,000 people every single month are retiring. Companies are complaining about a worker shortage. The unemployment is an extraordinarily low, given the rest of the things that we're facing. Central banks, and of course it's not just here, this is a common thing across the world, just because so is the baby boom. It's a global phenomenon. And central banks are reading this tight labor market and worker shortage as a harbinger of higher inflation down the road. Well, let's just ask ourselves, is it possible the signal coming from the labor market today is just as misleading as it was in the 1970s? Except, of course, in reverse. Do you think it's possible that the aging of the workforce today will lead to the same type of policy error that was made when the workforce was getting younger 50 years ago? Well, if that's a possibility, we should at least think about it. But if it is happening, inflation could fall even faster than action in labor markets today suggests it will. So that's my fourth reason. But if I'm right, what the labor market is telling us today is that we've switched from having too many workers over the past 50 years to too few. The thing is that the switch to too few, that's the normal part. That the past 50 years have been extraordinary in a historical sense. They aren't normal. But of course, anything that lasts for 50 years feels like it should be normal. But it's not normal. The baby boom bulge is not normal. So this is our new normal. It's a normal that, we, that was relevant back in the 1950s, probably. So the implications for the economy could be profound. The new sustainable path for the economy could be one which is characterized by higher wages for everyday workers, because they're in short supply, lower profit margins for companies, and I'll just remind you en passant that the share of income in the world going to capital as opposed to labor is at an historic high, and I don't mean just in our modern history, in all of history. The share of, of, of income going to workers is the lowest in any recorded history. Go back to Piketty's book. So the sustainable path of the economy could be one where we have higher wages, lower profit margins, and of course, that to make that into a triangle, more investment in labor-saving equipment and higher productivity. In other words, a wave of higher productivity in a historical sense. And in contrast, if you misread the situation, you're running the risk of disrupting all of that normalization, making it take far longer or going a messy route to get there. So what this illustrates is how a tectonic force acting beneath the surface of the economy can affect standard economic analysis. Now, I've identified five such forces at work, and all five of those are growing in intensity right now. Okay, they're almost always there, but they are moving hard now. They are, the one I've just mentioned, population aging. It's the most important one, I think. Well, we can argue about that. Second one, technological progress. The fourth industrial revolution has begun. We've only had three industrial revolutions in all of history. So these are important events and they've been hugely disruptive. The fourth one is expected to disrupt 15 to 20 percent of the global workforce. Digitization of everything. Third, rising income inequality. Oh. And what happens with rising income inequality? 
the associated polarization of politics. People tap into those who are feeling left behind. Fourth, growing indebtedness. Well, no elaboration necessary. It's everywhere, but especially governments, given what happened through the pandemic. And fifth, the transition to net zero carbon emissions. So I won't elaborate on those, but just to say these five tectonic forces happen to be all growing in power at exactly the same time. We aren't talking a few months or a couple of years. This is like 10 to 20 year kind of transition period, an inflection point in our economic history. Now, it's possible to think about each of these tectonic forces one at a time just as I just did around population aging. Okay? That can be quite fruitful. But because all five of them are rising in strength at the same time and can interact with each other, magnify each other, the situation is actually far more complex than can be managed by any of our standard economic models. Just as a quick illustration, if you're having an industrial revolution, what happens? You adopt new technology. Your competing firm is racing to adopt the same technology as you are. How does that competition shape up? You start cutting prices, passing the value on to the consumer in order to, to eat the other company's lunch. Okay? So, you know, industrial revolutions are usually intensely dis disinflation or deflationary episodes. Okay? It's a positive kind of deflation, right? It's making everything, that's how the, the purchasing power from the new tech gets spread around to everybody. Well, if you've got, you know, if you're a company with, you know, 30 million or 50 million in debt with a bank, that's a number. And if your headline revenue line is falling because of falling prices, even though you're, you've got the volume to go with it, your ability to service that headline number is eroding fast. And that's where depressions come from. Debt plus deflation equals depression. That's what I mean by interactions and, mag and magnifications. So there's an exotic branch of mathematics, which is called chaos theory, that analyzes complex nonlinear systems. Okay, enough for the tech stuff. This is what we would do if we had tried to create a theoretical model that captured all five of my tectonic forces. That would be an intensely nonlinear system with lots of interactions. So chaos theory is very well named because it concludes that when several nonlinear forces are in motion and interacting with one another, the system basically delivers chaotic outcomes. In other words, our economy, with these nonlinearities operating, can generate completely inexplicable outcomes, data that would not fit into any of your models, just noise. So chaos theory lies behind things like the, the, the butterfly effect, which you've heard of. There's a movie about it. And it explains the regularly observed random phenomena, like clear air turbulence when you're flying. That's why they say fasten your seatbelts, because it's totally unpredictable. Now, I'm predicting that these five tectonic forces are going to grow over the next 10 to 20 years. They're going to interact with each other in, in exotic ways and they will create inexplicable economic and financial volatility, a higher level of volatility than we've become used to. And since these events will be inexplicable, either ex ante or ex post, people will call them black swans, just like they did for the Victorian Depression. They didn't say black swan back then because we didn't have that term back then. Or the global financial crisis, okay? But this analysis suggests that there will be more frequent recessions and booms, bouts of inflation and deflation, much higher probability of losing a person's job, more company bankruptcies, much higher financial volatility, whether it's interest rates to stock markets to exchange rates. So just to sum that all up, that's just an argument that says we can indeed put the current inflation environment behind us, that episode, but we will be left with an increasingly volatile world once it's behind us. And this is going to accentuate Canada's weaknesses. There will be more labor market churn. There will be a persistent K-shaped economy, okay, the top part doing well, the bottom part getting hit hard by technological change. But that's how we describe things during the pandemic, right? People got shut down, we're on the bottom part of the K. Top part of the K flourished 
and grew all those new jobs and people moved from the bottom part of the K to the top part of the K. And then when you turn the economy back on, we had a shortage of workers. It's not rocket science. There's going to be rising income inequality, making that situation worse. Therefore, more political polarization, more financial fragility. There will be even less investment because of all this uncertainty. And, of course, therefore, even lower productivity. You know, we can, we can maybe say, well, we're second last in the OECD. Maybe we can make it last. But, of course, everybody will have the same experience. So we have the opportunity to chart a path forward which is far better. How do we do that? Well, we invest in resilience so that we are better able to manage risk. In fact, when we're well prepared for risk, we will find ways to capitalize on the risk. In effect, companies will convert risk into value if it's well managed. So I'll focus on a few of my favorite suggestions, suggestions that are practical and would realistically make a difference. So these are, these are suggestions for governments. The first one is to create maximum clarity. When you're faced with a lot of uncertainty, if you can clear anything up, it helps. Clarity is the obvious antidote to uncertainty. And there are lots of areas where the government today creates ambiguity, which could be converted to clarity. The result would be a higher track for investment by business and therefore a higher track for productivity growth and therefore more resilience. Examples. Trade uncertainty. Still really high. Even though we were able to renegotiate NAFTA satisfactorily, five years after Donald Trump candidate first said he would tear it up, okay, when he got to office, that took almost the entire four-year time to renegotiate NAFTA. And throughout that period, would you have bet your company that NAFTA would be satisfactorily put back together? Not me. We should not be content today with what they call USMCA, which I would prefer to call Kuzma, but anyway. We should be building more cross-border commitments with the United States. We should be seeking clarifying amendments to the USMCA. Make these investments now before we have to deal with another hostile administration. We should post the requirements of USMCA or Kuzma on the web and, and welcome any other country bilaterally to join up with Canada. Anybody. And no career, career extending negotiations just a cookie cutter. We worked hard on this. You want to sign up? Here are the requirements. Just sign here. When our trading partners do something that delevels the playing field in trade, our very first order of business must be to level that playing field. Not months or years later, not extended negotiations, just level the playing field. Second, Net zero uncertainty. Now, we all know net zero by 2050. That's pretty clear. It's obvious. All right. Just this past weekend, though, somebody said, well, let's write into this COP27 thing that it's okay to do carbon capture to help us get to net zero. That sounds pretty sensible to me. Net means net, after all. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We have to get fossil fuels down to zero and, you know, all that. I know that's one path to net zero. But there are many other paths to net zero if we force people to take the word net seriously. But today, our energy sector lives in limbo. Now, will Canada be allowed to have a thriving conventional energy sector under net zero emissions? Technically, I know we can but today's stance is far too ambiguous to permit the investments to happen to actually create that energy security. Clarity would unleash investment in efficiency, in carbon capture, new production and export capability, a huge boost to international security, and a boost to Canada's productivity. Third, project uncertainty. Now, we want to do things better here in Canada. We are better whether from an environmental perspective or from a societal perspective, we all agree with this. 
But in the process, our processes have become ambiguous. Timelines are never set, never held to realistic standards from a business point of view. Hey, face it, time is money. Time lost is productivity lost. Not just today, but forever. It's gone. You know, the LNG opportunity is an obvious example. So actively, we should reduce all these kinds of uncertainty, trade uncertainty, net zero uncertainty, and project uncertainty. All of these can be done at zero fiscal cost. Second avenue, pick the low hanging fruit. Federal provincial regulatory differences and trade barriers absolutely need to be fixed. This is money, time, and productivity absolutely wasted. Invest heavily in federal provincial relations, spend the political capital, whatever it takes to create stronger political incentives to get things done. It's possible that we get into a low or zero growth world here in Canada with zero growth in productivity maybe we'll suffer enough to actually force political consensus around some of these things. I certainly hope so. Hope it doesn't get to that. It shouldn't have to because it's free money. There's other things we could do under this title. We could say, let's raise the retirement age to boost our economic capacity. Let's create incentives or subsidies for companies to retain experienced talent longer into their careers, post-career periods, to help build capacity to deal with a more volatile future. Third area, build financial buffers. Pandemic debt has been managed quite well, to be honest. It could have been far worse. In the dark days, we thought the, the federal debt to GDP ratio could go to 60% or higher. It was at 30% when it started. And at the time, I said, you know, we can manage that because it's, after all, way better than we were in 1994. 60% is way lower than 67%, which is where we were in 1994. But it never even remotely got close to that because everything was so effective. We were resilient in the first place, as I argued before. But normalization of interest rates means that fiscal sustainability now has a higher hurdle rate. Okay, interest rates still need to be below our nominal growth rate. They are right now because inflation's high. But higher nominal growth is going to need Immigration efficiency, okay, because we're not producing new workers ourselves. Not net, we aren't. And we need higher productivity, given all the things I've already discussed. I won't touch on that. But along the way, we can build a fiscal buffer for the next shock, because they are coming. Individuals will not be able to manage the risk by themselves. So getting back to 30% as a ratio of federal debt to, to GDP would be good. 20% would be far better. And we now have to be mindful that provincial debts are there too. When we add up government debt, we look just as indebted as other countries. We should stop bragging about how we're better, because actually we are not. We need to prepare for a new pandemic-sized fiscal event every five years, and we're not prepared. Well, those are just some of the things I think governments could usefully do. Most of them could be delivered at little or no fiscal cost. In fact, I think most of them would deliver a fiscal dividend because they would raise trend economic growth in Canada and therefore they would raise government revenues. So whatever it costs, they would more than pay for themselves. There's certainly no need to boil the ocean to make progress on this front. Now, I think we need to focus our attention on these kinds of items given the state of government finances, but also because the global trend toward polarized politics is very likely to prevent us from making real progress in the future on these structural items. And in case that ends up being true starting now, governments should be thinking of how private companies will manage in this higher risk environment. They will be the ultimate risk managers rather than governments. And with this in mind, there are things that governments could do to help the private sector to, to build more resilience for it on its own part. And hopefully capitalize on it. Now, companies will be facing a more volatile environment, and the biggest risk that they will face is not having the workers to get the job done. So I think companies will increasingly see it as their job to manage risk on behalf of their employees. A few quick hits from this line of thinking. 
more in-house skill transition training, lifelong learning, underwritten by the employer. Of course, and with your alma mater. More diverse compensation plans. Those include things like income maintenance during employment gaps, in-house child care, mentorship programs based on retaining retirees, a return to a defined benefit pension plan. In other words, companies will invest more and more into the S of ESG, and shareholders will reward the ones that do it, just as they do today for those who invest in E and in G. Now, some of this sounds really ambitious for small companies. So what I expect to emerge are insurance companies that create risk umbrellas for small companies. And governments should put more emphasis not on small companies anyway, but on young companies. Old small companies generally stay small. But young small companies will occasionally deliver that hockey stick growth. And the productivity growth that comes from that, that's the main source of productivity growth in any economy. So my suggestion is that governments should find ways to incentivize these employer-employee evolutions now so that we're better prepared for the next stage of uncertainty. Market power is clearly shifting from employer to employee even today. And it's going to shift much more. If we don't get in front of this, we could see a renaissance of labor unions. That wouldn't necessarily be a problem, of course, but it's a different sort of business risk and needs to be managed also thoughtfully. Well, anyway, it's time for me to conclude and take some questions. We are an important inflection point, whether it's demographically or technologically or for sure politically. And we're not that well prepared for this more volatile future. And just as we tell our kids, keep your options open when they're going to high school or to college or to university, as a country, we need to keep our options open, invest more in adaptability and resilience. And much of this requires no fiscal outlays at all, none. It just requires that we be smarter about it and more collaborative. And it sounds like the Canadian way to me, or should be. Yes, we face a volatile future. But let's remember that volatility is two-sided. You know, of course, you prepare for volatility thinking about bad luck. But good luck comes in pretty similar doses. In fact, over the sweep of history, bad luck has always been less than good luck. Good luck always dominates over time. Let's look forward to that. Thank you. Here comes the moderator. Oh, I'll just do it. Sorry, the room's okay. Yeah. Oh, so we're not going to have a moderator. I got to I sent him back. Okay, so questions at the back. But maybe you can just jump up and it's not that big a room. Yeah. So, I mean, there's only there's only two ways to uh, to grow. Uh, you need first of all, most important ingredient of growth is people. You know, uh, productivity is the other part. But you can't do it without people. So, if we were growing our own population, we would need more housing and we would need more medical care and more infrastructure in general, right, in order to manage that growing population. So that problem isn't different, whether you're having people immigrate or creating people you know, domestically. So uh, any, any growing economy needs to continually be investing and should be investing ahead of those things, right? So it shouldn't be like always catching up, which is, of course, by the way, that is kind of the Canadian way, always trying to catch up. So um, I, I don't think of it as a premise, as a problem. It's, it's certainly one of those things, it's just a fact, and you need to get in front of it. Is it sustainable? Yes, because actually there's no alternative. I mean, like you could think of one, but that would be as a zero growth world or close to it. You're just a productivity growth world. And that uh, we're all headed there someday. But in the meantime, we're in, a, we're in a privileged place where, you know, Canada attracts more than its share of immigration for really good reasons. Uh, what I, if you take this argument seriously, everybody is going to come to the same conclusion. 
and be competing harder for the globe's immigrants, those who are moving. And so we won't have this, uh, you know, people lining up, you know, forever to come here. What we should try to ensure that we do, right? So that means uh, doing all kinds of things. My favorite one is it's the, the worst possible time when you're bumping up immigration. You say, oh, I've got to fix the housing problem. We've got to fix so many things. And medical care, I agree with all that. But it, the best channel of immigration that we have is our university system. So it's uh, absolutely the worst time ever in recorded history to nickel and dime universities, right? So I know you like that comment, right? So here we go. <laughs> huh. Yes, sir. Oh, I thought, yeah, I've thought about it a lot. And, uh, and so uh, that's why, what I mean. You, you've given us a case study of exactly what I'm talking about when I think we have to realistically manage these risks, otherwise your business will not grow because you can't, because you can't keep people or attract people uh, to get the job done. My guess is that you will need to at first give away some profit margin in order to manage that, that risk. And then over time, you help find ways to restore it through technology or other investments. And there's a higher, economists would say, a higher capital labor ratio, you know, in the in the ultimate solution. Um, and I wouldn't say your com your company sounds like pretty tech savvy, but as 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 an average in the Canadian economy, we have vastly under underinvested compared to other economies during the past decade. And that's why our productivity numbers are so low. And I've given reasons why that might be the case. It's not because, you know, we're lazy or dumb or any of those things. It's just because we've faced a wall of uncertainty. Companies during the Trump administration actively invested in the United States instead of in Canada to help them qualify for Buy American. If that became the dominant business model, I would have done the same thing. And so what we need to do is reduce uncertainty so those things can, can be fixed up. But your, your problem, you're just wrestling right now at the front line with what I'm talking about, that rise in employee power. I don't see any way around that except to enrich uh, those, those comp plans and, and then use your, your ingenuity to bring your profit margin back. That's, that's what I think will happen to the whole economy. Well, as long as you don't have a, com a competitor, I think you can get away with that. But, but most people don't have that luxury, and so you it is it is a bit of a dogfight, and so you end up going the you know keep eating their lunch by having the best people, right? So, if you have the best people, you'll you'll beat the competitor that way on quality and flow and growth of your business, as opposed to that minute by minute margin. That's anyway, in a nutshell. I, I, I'm not trying to make it sound easy because I know it isn't. And that down at the micro level, it's going to be terrifically difficult. But that is how it's, it's going to be a persistent environment, not just now. It's going to be 20 years. Tom. Stephen. It's probably um, going to be a doozy. Uh, no, no, not saying. at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> Slam dunk for you. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much for uh, laying out a very sensible and provocative 
uh, agenda on how we deal or capitalize on a volatile future. And um, incidentally, for those of you who have not read uh, Steve's book, recent book, it's an absolute must read. I can, uh, I can recommend that very, very strongly. Um, one of the problems that we have in Canada, and I know we'll be talking about this uh, during the day, is that arguably we're one of the best countries in the world at generating good ideas, on generating good solutions uh, mm -hmm. to sometimes difficult, sometimes not so difficult issues. Just to pull one out of the blue that you've talked about over and over again, that we've been debating in this country since the 19, early 1980s, if not the late 1970s, and that's inter-regional barriers to trade. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not asking you to comment on that specifically, but just using that as an example yeah. that you have used over and over again. And it's something that we could do at virtually no cost, but with huge, huge benefits. Mm -hmm. So the frustration I think that many of us feel in this country is we've got good ideas, got good solutions, I think some of them, in policy terms, are among the very best that I've seen in the developed world. So what are your views on how we actually get it done? Because that, to me, is the number one challenge, the number one priority. <laughs> I told you it would be a doozy, right? But, but you know, uh, Tom, you know, I've, I've, you're right. I've said these, some of these things over and over. It feels like my entire professional life been on the same thing and uh, and I just kind of get in, fixed in my head that the political reality is that some of these things are extraordinarily difficult to do and so you have to I think ask after 20 or 30 years of trying do we have the, the right incentive structure I mean do we you know in the, in the fiscal space at the federal level for instance I mean we're always dishing out funds for one thing or another do we ever tie those flows to good performance? Well, we try on medical care, for instance. We say, well, we want, we want data like this, and this is what the latest thing I heard. We want more data on how it, the money is being used. After all, it's federal tax points generating this money. Absolutely not. You know, like it's like, you know, I swear if, if we put out a, a, a bulletin this morning that says we encourage all provincial premiers to brush their teeth twice a day, they would stop. Like it, they would just stop. Like, and of course, because it's not, it's not your jurisdiction, you know? So there's always this tension. I don't really see a solution except to build stronger incentives. Uh, and that's just the economist in me that says that, right? So if the incentive was, well, you know, here's, here's, here's your flow from, you know, Ottawa to, let's say, Fredericton, for instance, um, you know, what sorts of uh, things could we do in there to nudge you know, you know, like Alberta unilaterally in, 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 uh, eliminated its interprovincial trade barriers. Well, that's a pretty astute move in my view, but it only works if everybody follows. But anyway, that, I just think, I, honestly, I don't know. So that there, I've, I've, I've skated around long enough, and I, you know, there's, there's no, I'm not getting a shot. I'm going to pass the puck. So uh, next question. <laughs> but I'm hopeful. You know that that we can, and maybe the tensions of the current time will make it, will motivate it more, right? When growth is zero, if you could have one percent growth for free, it counts bigger politically than when growth is already three. That's kind of my always been my thought, and we're grinding it lower and lower, so we're getting into a place where it'll count so much bigger. 4% of GDP is lying on the sidewalk and no one will bend over to pick it up. I don't get it. Dean. Um, thank, is this on? Yeah, yeah. good. Uh, so just thinking through some of the things you've been talking about, wage, and, uh, wage increases that are likely to be coming and are already coming. I worry about um, on the and I don't know what is happening in the other provinces, I probably should know more about it, but on the Ontario side, there's this 1% cap on a lot of our public sector workers right yeah, now. Yeah. Um, and just the consequences of that, in some of our most important industries, I'll just use healthcare uh, as the example, and 
what's happening from people leaving the country because yeah. the opportunities to get the you know increased wages that they need to be able to do their jobs better um, are not happening. Do you yeah. have a perspective on that? Yeah. So this this the, the thinking around that is that any wage increase is an inflation increase, or at or the, at least a fiscal draw that we can't afford. So there could be a real constraint uh, behind that. But mostly the mentality is around, well, we can't allow, you know, wages to, to kind of take off because that for sure uh, uh, gives us the risk of a wage price spiral and the inflation gets locked in and then we're a decade like we were back in the 80s. So, I'm, of course, I'm totally sympathetic to that argument. But I think what we need to do is give a little bit of room for actually in real terms, like wages are falling, you know, like in this situation, you can't. When the when what is what is happening to you is coming from the outside, you can't control oil prices or fertilizer prices or that kind of thing. Um, so some of that has to be absorbed. You know, if they if if they double the price of something you regularly buy, you just say, well, I'm not going to buy it as often or whatever. You'd adapt, you'd adapt, but a necessity that doesn't happen. So it's a lower income for everybody, and you can't uh, settle you know, wages around it, or you can't. Companies can't just pass it on. It, it, somehow it needs to be absorbed by the system, a higher cost of food and energy, let's say. Um, the way around that is to boost our productivity so our incomes go up and, and that fixes it over time. Um, and, and that's where we should focus our efforts. But in terms of constraining things to 1%, that, that is completely ignoring the argument about the shortage, which is more fundamental. I don't think the shortage... The shortage that companies are reporting back to me, that's very structural. That is not because of the K. So in the most of the vacancies that, the, that keep getting referred to, we, the vacancies leapt up to like a million the day we opened the economy back up. It hasn't been growing. It's actually been shrinking a little bit, right? And so I think that problem can take care of itself with the immigration flow. But in the end, we'll still have more underlying tension because of this need to boost real wages, and we'll have to invest more in capital equipment in order to manage that as a, on costs in our companies and probably also in universities. So, I know that's not that sounds nice on paper, yeah. Aaron, boy, I got got a big a lot of action up in the front row here. I, I'm going to look back there next time see see some other hands. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. That was an excellent presentation. Um, so just picking up on, on the, the talent and, 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 and people piece, um, you know, we really are shooting ourselves in the foot in Canada because we, we have some of the best academic institutions, a high quality of education. We, we join out this talent, but then we lose most of it to other, to other countries. Those high paying jobs that need uh, to be anchored here are, are not. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem is this federal, provincial, you know, when people come look at it from the outside, Canada looks very fragmented. I mean, that's the first word they use, whether it's mm -hmm. our healthcare system or our education system, it's fragmented. Right. Right. So don't we need to address the fundamentals, actually, instead of putting sort of band-aids now, uh, you know, it, you know, we talk about our healthcare system and everyone says, well, you know, Tommy Douglas in 50 years, yeah, it's 50 years old, don't we need to modernize it? It was great 50 years ago, other people copied it and then they had the 2.0 and 3.0 versions of it. Yeah. Why, uh, you know, are, are we so set in this psyche where, you know, governments will just not look at, yeah, it's a big bite, yeah, yeah. yeah these are big reforms. How do we how do we mobilize that and more because really until we do that we're really band-aiding a lot of these problems. Yeah, so my my quick response to that is that that is what you're you, the same thing that Tom was putting his finger on. These are huge, like really big, boily ocean kind of issues. I don't know. I mean, in my whole life that's been true, and I've thought about it a lot, but I don't have a solution for that. Uh, except a political one, and I'm talking about incentivizing politics to, you know, to work harder in the directions we're talking about, as opposed to often it seems kind of at cross purposes. It's not really. It's just got to do it our way, as opposed to your way. That kind of why are you trying to tell me what to do? So it's this 
kind of a thing that goes on. Okay, but that's human. I mean, I, this is the kind of the federation the way it was built. So we have that as a reality. So I, so I try to so, so sweep that aside and say, okay, that's really hard. I don't know what to do about it, but let's at least tackle the low-hanging fruit. I mean, we ought to be able to do that. It's not even like it's going to cost any money. We can just do those things, and we'll be better off. And at least we'll see, we'll see the reaction, we'll see the performance, and be like, wow, let's do some more of that. But if we get stuck in, well, we can't boil the ocean, therefore we can't do anything, that's kind of where I feel like we are. So let's forget about boiling the ocean. Let's, that's today, and I hope this, we get more ideas along those lines as we go through the day, that we'll just write them down and say, you know what, you could do this. And actually, here's how I would sell it politically. Now off you go. And maybe some of that could actually happen. But if we say boil the ocean, they're going to like, yeah, well, we're already boiling the ocean. We just need a little more wood and stuff. You know, we're, we're working on it. But anyway, actually, we want to convert it to electric first, you know. Anyway, so we'll be waiting. Anyway, two minutes. Was that, is that what the end or two questions? Two questions. Two questions. Oh, that's more than two minutes. <laughs> At the very back, please. There we go. Morning. It's a pleasure to hear from someone who remembers the 1970s better than I do. That doesn't happen so often. These days. Oh, it's because I only read about them. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd read about them. Um, I wanted to ask you to put your uh, comments in a bit of an international context. Uh -huh. you, the demographic trends that you talk about, the big baby boom, is a really Canada-U.S. phenomena. Mm. It was dampened even in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess what I'm kind of interested in is what could we learn from other countries that are either younger or older than us um, and facing similar or different problems as, as a result? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the answer is not much, uh, to be honest. Of course, the, 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 it's true that we, we, are, we will feel the, that, that curve of the hump of, of population more here uh, than in other places, but that hump is is a global hump, and uh, so everybody's going to be dealing with aging at the same time. Um, I think ours is just very well defined. Okay, so it's it's, it's not it's, there's not really a difference, but we can we can look at how countries uh, such as Japan have have gone along with almost zero immigration. You know, with with no labor force growth, and you know they actually underneath. The hood they've done actually pretty well okay so it looked like they weren't doing anything for the longest time but actually they were and then in the last few years they've really boosted their their labor force participation by uh, creating a system where more women would participate in the workforce there's a big big lesson in there so I'm a, I'm pretty excited by the child care thing I mean lots of details there but the idea of of a stronger public sector presence in child care uh, made a huge difference in Quebec, and it will make a huge difference for the country. And you know, we've, it's been in the it's been talked about for so long. You think, well, when's that going to happen? It happened last month here in Ontario. Okay, the 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 child care centers just now are on the program, and so. I think, uh, well, last month, September. So, so um, I think, for example, last month we got this data point, which everybody said was this uh, actual blockbuster, 108,000 jobs, new jobs created in Canada uh, during the month of October. And you're like, well, that's 10 times what all those forecasters were expecting. That's, that's a real forecast error. That's not some noisy thing. And if you look underneath it, sure enough, there were 110,000 new people entered the workforce in the month of October. Well, this is what we need, folks, okay? This is supply-side stuff, not demand-side stuff. So the market's kind of interpreted it as, oh, my gosh, the economy's even stronger than we thought. That's not, yeah, it is, but because of expanding supply, not demand. So, so this is exactly... Uh, what we need uh, going forward. That is fabulous kind of performance. And I would put it down to the pickup in immigration. And it's not a coincidence that the child care thing is just kicking in this fall. And so that'll be parents that, you know, one or the other was deciding, well, can we, can I go back to work or should I stay here with this two-year-old or three-year-old? Um, and the answer is, oh, I think we can swing it now. And so off we go. Uh, so I think we've got a lot of good news that can still come through that pipe. 
Uh, anyway, I've got I've digressed now. I don't have a, a great answer f for you, but I would just remind you that it's not just us. It, it really is everybody. And so we'll be competing for those immigrants with other countries. It's not going to just happen that easily for us. And so we're going to have to fix the housing and make it you know, more affordable to come here. We've got to keep putting money into our best channel, which is universities. Okay? I mean, you're not going to nickel and dime a university and find yourself with a perfectly skilled workforce 10 years from now. Sorry, that's not how that works. Okay? So we've got to put our investments in the right places that will build true long-term productivity track and resilience. Are we, oh, two, you said, right? So one more. So I have to pick and choose. This one here? You want me to pick this one here? Okay, go ahead, Karen. Sorry. Sorry to you. I'll, I'll be around all day and we can talk for sure. Steve, over the last uh, 30 years, successive governments... It's on, it's on, yep. Yeah. Okay. Successive governments have brought in uh, programs to close the gap between us and... Com on competitiveness between us and other countries. Yeah. They've used different names, uh, prosperity initiative, innovation mm -hmm. initiative, what have you. Yeah. Everyone has been a spectacular failure. Yes. Why? And what reason do we have to believe that we can do it differently this time? Yeah, so um, I, would, I would take most of those things and kind of put them under the, my, I know this is an, a bit unfair, under the boil the ocean column. We're going to fix everything in this one big announceable. And then, you know, for another couple of years of some kind of effort in that direction, not much has actually happened, but it's, we got to refresh that so we announce something else that's in that column. Um, I, I would much rather get, have, a, have a meeting over a weekend and say, we're not leaving until we got five concrete announceables to come out of this room that will actually boost the productivity line here in Canada, like right away, not... 10 years from now or five years from now. And, you know, immediately they start saying, well, we, what we really need to do is this. What we're, you know, oh, no, sorry. No, we, we created a list of 30 things, and they require FedProv collaboration to get, get someone to, let's not leave this room unless at least five of them can be announced tonight. And we'll all go out and say we spent no money except what we, you know, we had lunch. We spent no money, but we got this done, and it's actually going to help. And look at us, we can actually do stuff. Wouldn't that be a great announceable? And, and not only that, but it's going to improve fiscal finances because it's just endogenous. It's going to create more revenues for us. How about that as a solution? That's like huge. I think I'd be politically motivated to do that if I was a politician. So I've tried to put emphasis on that. And I think instead of the grander the scheme is, the least likely it becomes to get actually done, we know that. It's very hard to mobilize around it. Um, you know, politics is hard, it's hard, it's, you know, you know it, Perrin. This is, politics is the hardest job on earth, and it's only getting harder. Uh, if, if anything's harder, it's the folks that work underneath, you know, try to make these things into reality. And while reconciling all the differences at the table and well, what's politically possible and all that kind of thing. It's really, really hard. So let's focus on just clipping the low-hanging fruit. Let's make companies more prepared. They are the employers. They're the ones that have to deal with this. Let's put all the things in place that make them more able to do it. Instead of throwing up smoke that makes them uncertain or sending new regulations their way that somehow is just going to confuse the situation. So I know that's a little bit vague. But I'm a first speaker. Let's talk about it at the end of the day. Um, so uh, we can't we can't do everything in one session. But thanks so much, folks. Great question. See you through the day. <laughs>